Coach, how are you? Doing fine, Gary. Good to be back on with you. Well, good to have you, man. I was looking forward to visiting with you. And, and let's start out because I was thinking back um, years ago, I mean, you, you had your nine full-time assistants, you had your support personnel, you'd have, I guess, four GAs. But I never really heard much about analysts until, you know, Nick Saban at Alabama. I'm not saying they weren't around, but uh, especially if I thought of an analyst, I thought of some young guy that was, you know, watching film or video and, and, and logging play charts. But now you've got guys like yourself. You've got former head coaches, coordinators serving in these analyst roles at these big-time universities. <laughs> tell, tell our listeners exactly what you do as an analyst at South Carolina. Well, my specific job is, is directly to Will and uh, Coach Muschamp, and I, what I do is self-scout our offense as a, just kind of take it as if I was a defensive coordinator having to prepare to play for him the following game, and I give it to him and Coach Roper, our offensive coordinator, to, to look at it, and what I'm looking for, you know, they crunch all the numbers, the computer independences and all that. I, I look at it, things that I think we can exploit as a defense or things that I think are really, really going to be hard on the defense and give those things to them. And see if it's something that's, you know, a lot of times uh, you don't see those things in your coach and you don't know a player is tipping a play or you get right. into a, a tendency with a certain formation movement, those kind of things. The second thing, let's stay a week ahead of our defensive staff just breaking down opposing offenses that we're going to play. And on Sundays when we start on the next opponent, I'll give them an, an overview of what, you know, what we're getting ready to play, what, who we're getting ready to play. Will, Will does such a thorough job. He, mm-hmm. he is his own coordinator, as y'all well know. He does such a thorough job. Uh, I'm not sure my information is adding a whole lot to it, but it gives them a good jump start on the week to uh, to get going. That being said, an analyst could be, uh, their jobs can be a lot of different jobs. Right. Like this. Some of them are very much more involved with the players on a, just a counseling basis or an academic basis. Uh, some of them are doing more things in quality control with film study than I do. So my job's a little bit more directly reporting to the head football coach. Every football coach on our staff, every full-time on-the-field football coach either has a graduate assistant or an analyst that is their right-hand man and does whatever they need to to do to uh, help them prepare to coach their position. That's unbelievable. Uh are you enjoying it? I mean, it keeps you in the game. Maybe not, uh, you know, uh, as an on-field full-time assistant, but uh, are, are you enjoying what you're doing? It, it's not nearly as fulfilling as coaching itself, Gary, but you, know, you reach that point where you're not sure you're ready to get out of coaching. I heard Coach Dye say one time, it's not whether or not you can uh, to, uh, can you get along like coaching. He, he said, can you live without coaching? And so it's not easy to quit things. You, know, you see these athletes who, to play for 40 years and so forth. It's not easy to give up things like that. Mm-hmm. And this has been a good transition. I guess it's been a good withdrawal because I, I told Will, he wanted me to go on the field and coach. And I said, Will, unless I'm running defense, I just don't have the motivation to do it. And even today, if I had an opportunity to coordinate a power five defense, I'd probably get up in the morning at 4 o'clock, you know, looking for the first, first uh, chance to get back over and get to work. But it's just reached that point where this has been really enjoyable to me to stay around the game, stay around the kids. Will's assemble a great staff. I've enjoyed being around them. It can be at least a little boring at times because I'm not as busy. Uh, I'm over here long hours and not quite as busy as some of the other guys. But overall, it's been a real pleasant experience, and I just hope what I'm doing is giving them some help. I'm sure it is. Ellis Johnson, our guest on the Bud Light Hotline, and there's some good buzz coming out of Columbia. I thought last year in his first season – uh, Will Muschamp did a really good job with that team. Uh, you know, there's no doubt he learned a lot while he was the head coach at Florida. His football IQ, I think everybody agrees, is off the charts. And uh, you're in a division where, you know, let's be honest. I mean, <laughs> you look one through seven in the East Division, you can make a case for just about every team in that league if they do this or this to have a chance to, uh, to win it and get to Atlanta. I, I'm sure as a staff at South Carolina, you guys aren't going to hand anything over to anybody. You feel like you got a chance to compete for that division championship. I, I would have to agree with you. I, it's easy to kind of overall view these things and make these statements. And of course, you look back six months later, nothing is accurate. But the West right now, I think, is a little bit stronger, especially the top four teams. Uh, we, if we were really fortunate with the injury situation and we make some critical plays at critical times and, and uh, you know, really good in the kicking game, some areas that are going to have to help us other than just lining up and, and 
defeating some of these teams, we, we would have a chance to, to win it just as much as three or four other teams would. I think you're right. That being said, I think there are a few teams on this side of the conference that probably have a little deeper depth charts, have some uh, key players in some spots that we don't have. And uh, the biggest thing right now, defense is very thin. If we get the wrong players hurt, it can mm-hmm. be devastating. Uh, we haven't really found a dynamic pass rusher. Uh, we've got a young man, uh, Wanham, Dennis Wanham, really come along. He may be one, but he has to prove it on the game field. And uh, so we'll have to have some things go our way. But I, I think you analyze this side of the conference pretty well. The one thing about overall with the conference this year, I, I thought the SEC last year might have been as average as I've ever seen it. And the really big thing was quarterback situations. Tons of teams were either breaking in new quarterbacks or using transfers or, or you know, quarterbacks that did not have a starting job the year before. And that's not true this year. I mean, there are only, I think, about four teams do not have a starting returning quarterback. And I think the league is going to be a lot tougher this year from top to bottom. And our out-of-conference schedule this year, Gary, is a lot harder than it was last year. Yeah, and you mentioned quarterbacks. That's that's one thing South Carolina has got, and maybe maybe Will didn't have that the whole time he was at Florida. He's young still, but Jake Bentley really flashed as a true freshman last year. I think I read he might have could have still been in high school had he not moved up his graduation date. Uh, there's got to be a lot of enthusiasm and optimism about the, this six four, two hundred twenty three pound kid that's uh, athletic, has a strong arm, and really did some good things last year for your football team. Absolutely. He did uh, leave high school early, but he also started school late. So age-wise and physical maturity, I mean, he, he hadn't missed a beat. But when you lose a season of high school football, obviously that's another year of progression. It could have helped him. But they were in a transit situation with their family. They didn't know whether to stay at Opelike and let him finish the season with the kids that he really felt close to, uh, bring him on up here, put him in a high school here in the Columbia area. And they, and they were really fighting whether to split up as a family and what, get through those six months or what to do. And I just said, heck, let's, I'm going to go ahead and go to college, get in spring ball, and, and uh, you know, jump in this program that summer and get to you know compete for the job. And I think it was the fifth game, uh, fourth or fifth game, he won the job and he, he played very well for, for a freshman. He's a typical coach's son. He knows football. He's always been sort of a gym rat mentality. Bobby hasn't been a very successful coach. Obviously, he gained a lot of knowledge before he even left the house. But uh, he's probably as good a leader as we've got on this field, although he's just a sophomore. And all the intangibles that you want out of a quarterback, he certainly has those, too. One interesting stat, I think, is said he was the best in the conference at completion percentage on downfield throws. Now, I don't know what downfield throws means. They throw so many bubbles and hitches and stuff <laughs> in the league now. I guess a downfield throw is anything beyond last week. <laughs> but seriously, he, he can make any throw on the field. And we've got a great receiver group. We've got some kind of tight ends and wide out as a whole in entire package. We've got about five or six kids in our receiver group that can really make plays. Ellis Johnson, our guest on the Bud Light Hotline. You mentioned the SEC last year outside of Alabama. I, I agree with you. I think it was a little bit down. And uh, the ACC pounced on the opportunity. They had a last couple of years. They had a really good year against the SEC, and then last year, of course, they got the the creme de la creme, the cherry on top, when Clemson beat Alabama in the national championship game. You're in a unique situation uh, in South Carolina. Of course, you got history at Clemson too, but your in-state rival is from the other league. Georgia deals with it with Georgia Tech. Of course, Alabama plays Auburn, and Mississippi plays Mississippi State. You got SEC versus SEC, but you're in a you're in a split state with the SEC and the ACC, and Clemson's the defending national champion. Uh, I've always thought football coaches were more focused on the teams they were playing and didn't get into this league versus league stuff. But it seems to me, Ellis, that the ACC coaches at their media day really pounced on this. We're the best league. We've proven it. We're better than the SEC. Uh, You're in a state where, you're, as I said, your main rival is the defending national champion there in the ACC from Clemson. How do you make this uh, SEC versus uh, ACC deal? What what do you make out of that? Well, I I think it's good, you know, because it it keeps – it's just like back before they had a playoff, it was who was number one and it kept things you know, kind of heated up over the offseason. But, you know, I've coached in both leagues. There's no question the top three or four teams in each league are, are extremely good. Uh, but but I think when you get into these matchups in the bowl game, if you'll look very frequently, teams in our – because we have better bowl attachments, teams in the SEC are usually matched up against teams in the ACC who finish higher in their conference. I don't think that's a good measuring stick. 
who wins the national championship is not necessarily as good measuring stick. That's one team. I think if you look overall from top to bottom is where it begins to separate. And I don't think the bottom half of our league last year was very good. And again, we talked about it earlier. It was, it was a year of quarterbacks. It was very unusual for this conference. But if you look at it top to bottom, and, and I don't want to start naming programs, but there's four, five, six programs in that conference that are absolutely non-competitive over the last four, five, six years. Right. And they're not playing good football. They're not, you know, it can be an advantage, though, to those two or three that are the best ones because they don't have tough games every weekend. It may not be as attractive to a group, but it, it really helps the team stay less injury prone and maybe be healthier when they get into the playoffs. And and, and I think there's a case to be made for that. But it, it's an endless argument, but I think it's good for football. And out there at times, I don't think either one of these two conferences were best in the league. So, uh, you know, who knows? I don't know how you compare conferences. There's so many different ways you could try to do it. But I think from top to bottom, there's no conference in this country that has the type of athletes you have to face every given Saturday in the SEC. Clemson has become so strong uh, under Dabo Swinney, who you know very, very well, obviously. Uh, but when you were with Spurrier, uh, there was a stint there where South Carolina was dominating Clemson. I think I think uh, uh, five in a row. And I know these rivalries can be cyclical, but being in that state, and of course I know Will Muschamp's just trying to get this program on, on solid footing, but uh, how much pressure is there right now, do you think, on South Carolina with what Clemson's doing to uh, – to become competitive again in their in-state rival? It, it's not, I don't just be pressure, Gary, but obviously the fan base, you know, when they're not happy and they see the other side that it's happy, it's human nature, you know, it just kind of puts a little more gas on the fire. And, uh, you know, when you beat them five years in a row and they're still recruiting some uh, classes there last, over the last two, three years that were good or better than Carolina's, it, it really doesn't make sense. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration is around here. But Coach Spurrier had a lot of uh, turnover on his staff those last few years, and I don't know if he knew how long he wanted to stay. And he, he did not want to make some of the changes he thought he needed to make. And, and I think it slipped a little bit. Uh, you, you can get it back here fairly quickly when you're recruiting uh, in this conference. Uh, kids want to play in this conference. We're in a great demographic location, you know, geogra- excuse me, geographic location of the demographics. I mean, North Carolina has become one of I think it is the 12th largest state in America, population-wise, and there's tons of players up there. They don't have an SEC team in the state, and then a lot of times you get kids to leave. Georgia football, Florida football, there are more players in those two states than those teams and those in-state teams can recruit. So we'll get our share back in the state again, and his process and his work ethic and his attention to recruiting has certainly been stepped up a huge notch from where it was before we came in. I think will will eventually put the kind of depth and talent that you've got to have to make it through this league. Coach, you pretty much already handicapped the East. Uh, everybody thinks they've got a shot. Uh, look at the West and just kind of an overview of the of the West uh, division. As you said earlier, and I agree, I think the West is still on paper going into the season stronger than the East. Uh, it starts with Alabama, but I know Auburn thinks they're going to have a really good team. LSU thinks uh, they're going to really be good. I think Bielema thinks that, that Arkansas is going to have a, a good team, and I've read that Kevin Sumlin – uh, feels like out at A&M, they got a chance to be the most balanced team he's had since he's been there. So how do you see this West Division playing out? Yeah, so many good coaches and so many, so many good players on both, all, excuse me, both of all those teams. One thing I'm a little saying about Arkansas, they were one of the only teams over there that did not have a coaching change at the head coach or the court, offensive coordinator or the quarterback. And I think they could be a lot better than people think they are. Now, I'm not as familiar with the defense, but I think they made a change there and uh, they've been competitive on that side of the ball. Alabama, obviously, has recruited so well on back to back to back to back years. They're going to be extremely good, and they've got their quarterback back, and he's got competition. Uh, Auburn is going to be very good on defense. They've recruited extremely well on defensive front. The, the whole question about Auburn and LSU is going to be whether or not they have a quarterback that comes through and plays at a level high enough to win that side of the uh, of the conference. Uh, the Atling kid was a starter, but I don't think their offense was in. You'd say was just coming back and be one of their strengths. So that's that's what I'd say. I think in, in Mississippi State is a team that uh, people I, may, I think maybe are underrating. Uh, Fitzgerald kind of made his debut against us last year, but I think he's probably as good a young quarterback as there is in the league. Right. 
they didn't have a turnover at head coach, coordinator, or quarterback. So they, they'll probably get off to a great start. Uh, we only played Texas A&M and Missouri last year from that side uh, and that we play again this year. And we also pick up Arkansas. And so uh, we, I don't know as much about that side, but I, I do agree. You know, A&M, again, they, they've got another quarterback. I mean, a third of the fourth one in that many years. So maybe the word balance is good for them. I, I got tremendous respect for uh, John Chavis, and I know they'll continue to improve on defense. But it may be the most balanced team he's had, but I still think they have a lot of questions at the quarterback spot that hasn't been answered yet. But uh, it, it's you know I think Auburn having Alabama at home will help them. It's everybody still trying to beat Alabama right now. I want to ask you about uh, Coach Saban's comments that he believes that Power Five teams should only play other Power Five teams. I mean, he and he said Power Five specifically. He didn't even say other FBS teams. You played at the Citadel. You've coached there. Uh, you know how important it is for FCS teams to be able to to you know play these FBS teams and Power Five teams for their for their whole athletic department financially. Um, your your thoughts on that and the one argument. You could say, what's well, not Alabama or South Carolina or Tennessee's job to supplement these FCS programs. But as you know, too, fans of those schools are just as passionate about their teams as, as your fans are, or Auburn's fans, or Alabama's fans. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of that? Do you like the idea that, that big power schools still play the FCS teams, or would you like to see well, Power 5 versus think, Power 5? When you talk about the financial side, of it, more important than the fans, you know, hoping their program get to play or whatever. I, I think you've got to be careful. If, if we don't watch it in about 10 or 15 years, schools are not, <clears throat> schools are not in the Power 5 money trough. We might be playing football right. anymore. And when you lose football, you lose a lot at the university. It's not just football. So I, I, just from a philosophical standpoint, I've coached on both levels, and I understand the vision from both you know, the, the Power 5 guys and the lower-level guys, but if you kill football on the lower level, it can have an effect on the power of five overall. If the football will become like boxing, they're going to lose viewership. They're going to lose numbers of fans. They're going to lose a lot of people's interest if it ever turns into that type of deal. And I'm afraid that's what will happen. On the other hand, I think Nick was responding to a question about the playoffs and what could make it better. And I think what he was saying made perfect sense. It's hard to say who the best four teams are when different teams are playing different right. opponents all up and down the ladder in the spectrum of, of difficulty. And if you didn't, if you kept, had to play Power Five, it'd be a heck of a lot more accurate when you start trying to pick those teams. So what he said made a lot of sense. I would just hate to see that for the health of college football overall because I think I think not only would it crush the smaller schools eventually, it would boomerang and deteriorate, I think, the game of football on this level altogether. And finally, Coach, you don't have to worry with recruiting in this position as an analyst, but uh, I want to ask you about the early signing period. I don't like it. That's just me personally. I, I, I like the way it was, but I see some coaches are in favor of it and some others, um, for various reasons, not a big fan of it. What do you think of the December signing period? Well, I always thought it was good. And when I came out of high school, there was one. And that was that only the ACC and the SEC honored. But most of the time, when kids signed it, he signed them in December. The other schools may come down two months later to try to take them away, but most of them didn't jump. I, I do see uh, some of the things have changed in recruiting since back then, though. And I think that now they're making some good points that what the way that NCAA has instituted it, it gets very confusing, and I don't want to get into the details because we still don't have time for that. But I, I think the way they've got it structured right now, you're going to end up seeing some problems. But overall, in general, I'm in favor of it. I think the less players involved in that last two-week crush, if you will, to get to the signing day, the less issues you're going to have with cheating, uh, with kids making pressure decisions and regretting them later on. Uh, I just think it eliminates a lot of the trash that goes on. Uh, there, there, there are bad things that go on in college recruiting. We, we don't need to put our head in the sand and try to you know, whitewash all that. But I think it really gets to the boiling point those last two or three weeks when that signing date is, is set. And, I, and the other thing is recruiting through the Christmas holidays and the bowl season and the national convention has become a dead young maze. I mean, there are almost no – they've killed about 20 recruiting days and also cut out some weekends that are possible for official visits. 
and everybody's about getting all the stuff tied up for January anyhow now because there's a lot of time left when you come back. The national championship game now is running all the way into the national coaches convention. So there are a lot of things that had to put dead periods in there. So I, I don't know how much actual contact recruiting goes on at that time, but there's still a lot of bad things that get involved in it because there's a lot of pressure on young kids, pressure on families, boosters sticking their nose in things, uh, coaches feeling the pressure to get the thing. So uh, in general, I'm in favor of it. I just don't know that the way they structured it in detail it is really a clean way to get it done. Coach, I enjoyed it. I appreciate you jumping on with us as busy as you are, and I know you uh, got duties with South Carolina, but maybe we can visit down the road again. Yeah, that sounds great. I wish it could be a regular thing. Our broadcast contract here in Columbia doesn't permit that, but I'd love to, to come on whenever I can, and I've enjoyed it. Last, uh, two years ago, it was something I really missed being on. Thank you, Coach.